Hello, my friends. Welcome back to the Cottage Kitchen at the Elliott Homestead. For those of you who are new here, we're a family that lives on just two and a half acres in the middle of Washington state. And on that land, we grow our milk, our meat, and a lot of our fruits and vegetables. Now we put all this effort in in the summertime so that we can fill our root cellar with those harvests and then eat on them throughout the winter. The problem is that winter produce looks a lot different than summer produce. And if you're not familiar with homesteading or gardening or producing things or storing those varieties, then they might look a little different than the produce that you're used to. Salads, for example, look a lot different in the winter than they do in the summertime. So I kind of want to walk you through what some of this looks like, what you can expect to see if you're going to be growing your own produce and kind of challenge this idea of fresh eating. A lot of times we think of fresh eating as I harvested this 15 minutes ago and that's great and beautiful and we love to celebrate those sorts of harvests in the summertime. But in the winter time, we're not eating fresh food. In fact, we're eating food that is months and months and months old. Let me give you an example. This cabbage came out of the garden in July, which means that as of now, it is five months old. And here is what it looks like. This looks a bit rough next to a store-bought cabbage, but I assure you all of those store-bought cabbages are probably just as old and they probably look just like this before they prepped them for the shells. And that's exactly what we do. I simply cut them off put them into my cold room, which is about the same temperature as a refrigerator, and they've been hanging out there completely out in the open for those entire five months. So in order to use this produce, we need to spend a little bit more time in the winter, sort of stripping back some of those exterior layers and revealing that goodness that's still inside. This is how we get to the place on the homestead where we're not wasting food. In fact, everything that I'm gonna be taking off of this produce today is going straight to my laying hens. And in the winter time when they're primarily on grain and they're not able to forage, it's a really welcomed treat and it keeps them really healthy as well. So it's a really beautiful cycle that contributes to the health of everything, ourselves included, overall. So here's sort of some common things you'll see with cabbage, just um, where the stem meets, it'll get a little, maybe a little bit gooey, hopefully not too gooey. The number one problem that I have with growing my cabbages is earwigs. I hate them a lot of times when I cut them open, even if they've been in the cold room for seven or eight months, I'll cut it open and an earwig will come out and it's just part of the fun. I always am kind of impressed, honestly, that they could live that long in there. But to use the cabbage, I'm just going to peel away. Save that. So today we're gonna to be using some of this uh, beautiful produce that we'll talk through, and we're gonna be making a winter slaw. This is going to look so different than our summer salads of roasted eggplant and fresh tomatoes and beautiful basil. I wanna show you the inside of this. This is a red market cabbage. Storage cabbages are really dense like this. There's very little space for oxygen on the inside and that's how they're able to store for so long. So this cabbage is really weighty, um, which is great because it stores well, but also because then you get a lot of cabbage from it. I would say this is probably a pound and a half just in this one half here. So when you're growing cabbages or any sort of produce for your storage, you wanna make sure that you get a storage variety because there are reasons that they've bred these certain vegetables to be able to last, whether it's the sugar level or something like this, where air can't get on the inside and cause spoilage. Now you can see this cabbage, you could continue to peel away layer after layer. It has some sunspots here where it got bleached by the summer sun and I have no problems eating that. So I'm just gonna slice this up nice and thin, move it over to my platter. We rely a lot on cabbage during the winter time because we don't have fresh greens coming out of the garden. So in the early, early spring, we'll be able to get things like spinach and arugula and lettuce. But this time of year, if we want a salad, <laughs> that salad is going to involve cabbage in some way. But that's a good thing. Uh, cabbage has this nickname of being the poor man's physician. And I often think about that when I'm preparing it. In fact, 
a lot of the foods that we store, such as garlic and onions, a lot of the crops that we enjoy in the winter are really good for our immune systems. Crops like cabbage, garlic, onions. All right, I gotta focus on what I'm doing. I'm gonna chop myself here. Okay, this is one quarter of one cabbage, which is really amazing. And at a time when there's not a lot of color, this is really welcomed and bright and beautiful. We would once again like to thank Kami Koto for being the sponsor of today's video. Long before we had a YouTube channel, these were the knives that I had in my kitchen. So when I get emails from people saying, hey, what knives do you use? It's easy. I use Kamikoto knives and they've been kind enough to extend $50 off of your first Kamikoto knife purchase using the code EHOME. I'll put a link to that below. These are Japanese steel knives that are forged by Japanese master craftsmen. And the result is a shockingly sharp knife that's easy to clean, that fits perfectly in your hands and that are made to last an entire lifetime. Michelin star chefs around the world use these knives because of the blade's wonderful precision and dexterity. They feel good in your hand and they would look really good under the Christmas tree. So use the link below and code EHOME for $50 off. All right, I think that's actually plenty for our salad today. So let's talk about celery. This is another crop that we grow a lot of and we had a ton left in the garden. I have freeze dried a bunch, dehydrated a bunch, and I still had a lot left. So I tried a little experiment and I just harvested off the celery. I wrapped it in damp tea towels and then put those whole bundles in my cold room. Again, the same temperature as a refrigerator. This is a little bit sadder than it was out in the garden, but on the whole, considering I cut this almost two months ago, I think it looks great. So when I grow my celery, I love the stalks for um, using in like chicken stock and things like that. But if I'm gonna make a salad, when I can choose what part of the celery that I wanna use, I always choose the leaves because they're more enjoyable to chew and they have a stronger flavor. So don't worry about those stalks. We're not gonna waste them. We're gonna either use those to flavor our chicken stock when we make our broth each week or just give them to the chickens. This is kind of a cool thing. When you buy celery at the store, I don't know why they do this, probably because they get really gross in transit. You don't see celery with leaves. Did you even know that this is a major part of the celery harvest? Usually the top half of my celery is all leaves. And that's not really a food that we get to eat when we just rely on buying stuff at the store. See, color, beauty, yum. All right, let's move on to our onions. So I grow different varieties of onions. I grow fresh Walla Walla onions because they're sweet and beautiful and I have family from Walla Walla so it always makes me a little happy to grow them. But I also grow storage onions. This is yellow of Parma. This is a great storage onion that I grow every year, about a thousand of them. And then I also grow a red carpet onion. Now most of my red carpet onions look great. They are made for storage and they store really well in our root cellar, or you could put them in a garage. But this is also what happens to onions. Every once in a while that one gets a wild hair and it just decides to bolt and really makes it unusable because the inside is all mushy and gross. So when you see this, one option that you have is just to cut those tops off, toss this, chickens won't eat it. You can compost it. But you can use these green, green tops of a bolted onion just like you would scallions or green onions. So we'll chop those up and put them in our salad as well. Onions should look like this in the winter. They should smell good. They shouldn't smell gross. And in order to sort of keep on top of my onions once a week, I have to just go through, look at everything, make sure none are rotting because inevitably they will. I would say in our root cellar, we probably end up with about a 10% shrink, meaning 10% of the onions, even though they're made for storage, don't actually last through the next summer. But what's amazing about onions is that 90% will, which means that we're gonna be eating on last year's crop all the way up into July or August when we harvest the next one. 
So this is still moist and beautiful on the inside. We're gonna add that to our slaw. Onions give spice. This is a sweet onion, so it gives a little bit of sweetness. They give a really good texture, a really good crunch. You can really smell everything in here already. What I love about a strong salad like this, it's strong with that stiff cabbage. It's got really fragrant celery and those spicy sweet onions is that it really holds up well next to a bold meat. So if I cook a beef roast in the oven in a bottle of wine with some balsamic vinegar and all these warming herbs, it needs something to contrast that. And that's exactly what a salad like this does. I think it's the perfect harmony between those winter meats and winter salads. All right, here's another fun storage crop. We got our real first big harvest of Granny Smith apples from our apple tree. And these are our great storage variety. I keep them in a lug in our cold room. Again, um, about the temperature of a refrigerator. Now I pulled these off about three months ago and you can see the skin is just sort of warbled a little bit. You can tell this isn't a fresh apple. So you might not just want to eat it like you would a normal apple, but it's the perfect apple for just chopping up fine and adding into a salad. It's also a perfect baking apple. So even though it's imperfect, we can use it in a lot of delicious ways in the winter kitchen. So you could make an apple galette, an apple pie. You could chop it and add it to your winter oatmeal, or you can make baked apples. I'll put a recipe for that below. Now, all of a sudden, we have something in our salad that's really crunchy and really acidic and sharp because these aren't sweet apples. They're really tart, really good. Okay, we are gonna be adding some walnuts to this salad as well. You can use any kind of nut you have. But what I wanna bring your awareness to is that if you put up nuts, if you store them, even if you just buy them in bulk, if you keep them in, their, in your pantry, they will go rancid fairly quickly. So in order to store nuts and to store them well, you either want to keep them in the shell, they'll store like that for a very long time, or once they're out of the shell like these are, you need to use them within about 30 days or put them in the freezer in just plastic bags and just bring them out in smaller portions because it's a very strong taste. Once you know what a rancid nut or a seed tastes like, you can taste it in any time. You can pick it out easy. Um, so these have just been pulled from the freezer and I'm just gonna give them a little bit of a mincing chop. Mincing chop, I don't think that's a thing. I think I just made that up. It's good to be aware of though. If you are growing any of your own nuts, or if you want to, or if you're able to get some locally in the fall when the nuts fall, um, it's good to be aware how to store them because they look really pretty in jars, I know, but they don't stay very well like that for very long. All right. So here's a bit of our fat and some more crunch. We got a good thing going on here. All right, a few more winter crops to work through here. These are Bolero carrots, a huge storage crop that we grow every year. Now again, this doesn't look like a perfectly fresh carrot, does it? These have been stored layered between straw, um, just barely damp straw in the cold room. And I use them all throughout the winter for flavoring my stocks and for adding to salads and roasts and stews and all the sorts of things like that. And in order to do them, you just have to deal with the dirt, wash them, 
And then once you peel off that older exterior, you're left with a beautiful carrot. Now what you'll find is that as the winter goes on, the carrots get less and less sweet. So when you first pull them from the garden, they're magnificent, but they just stay like that for a fairly short period of time. And then as they store, they just sort of lose that sugar, which all produce does as you store it. Everything's the sweetest straight when you pull it from the garden, but still beautiful to use. And I'm gonna use them in the salad today by just shredding them up on my box cheese grater and adding them in. More color, more flavor, more crunch. Along with losing a little bit of sweetness, you'll notice that as carrots age, they lose a little bit of moisture as well. So starting in the winter, your carrots are gonna stay fairly moist, uh, fairly watery when you grade them like this, but then as time goes on, they do tend to get a bit drier. It's just part of the process. I find it pretty amazing that we can make a salad this flavorful and this gorgeous with food that is not fresh at all. And it makes me wonder, should fresh food be the point? We eat a ton of it here, whether it's the milk from the cow, the eggs from the chickens, or produce from the garden. But I would so much prefer this winter salad made from not fresh produce than I would its equivalent uh, from maybe food that was pulled fresh, but from a long ways away. I have a sense of ownership in this because everything here we grew, we harvested, we stored. So even though it's not fresh, I delight in it. Now to go with our gorgeous winter slaw, we're going to make a homemade mayonnaise. Mayonnaise is not a word I even like to say really. It's not a condiment that we keep on hand unless we make it ourselves. And it sounds hard, but it's really not. And I'm gonna show you how to make a really quick and really easy version. If you don't have a blender, you can do the same thing just with a whisk in a bowl. So don't let this deter you. A basic recipe for mayonnaise is a pinch of salt, an egg yolk, and then one cup of oil per egg yolk used. And that'll equate out to about a cup of mayonnaise. I'm gonna go ahead and make a double batch. So I'm gonna use two eggs, two cups of oil so that I can have some in the refrigerator because it's also good on egg salad or in deviled eggs. And surprisingly, we have a lot of eggs from our chickens right now. We've put a lot of effort into making sure they're getting a lot of scraps from the kitchen and off cuts of meat. And they seem to be really relishing in that. I will always eat fresh eggs for as long as I can get them. But a lot of times chickens do stop laying in the winter uh, in order to preserve our eggs, we have freeze dried them into powder and we've also just put them into small containers and frozen them and that works great. So we do store up our extra eggs as we can when we're getting a lot of them so that we can pull from them in the winter time. Now we are going to be relying on a few fresh things. These are fresh eggs. These were just laid today by my chickens. And because we're not going to be cooking our mayonnaise, obviously, you want to make sure your egg, egg yolks are nice and fresh. I also have some fresh lemons, which is a winter crop. So these are really good this time of year. Grapefruits and lemons are always just, they just feel like a luxury in the winter time when everything else is cold and dark. I actually have my lemon trees and grapefruit trees and an orange tree in my bathroom downstairs because it likes the humidity from the shower. And so that's where it's hanging out for the winter time. So I like lemon juice in my mayonnaise. I find it just sort of cuts it. Actually better do too, because I like it. You could use vinegar if you don't have good lemons or if you like the flavor. Okay, we are gonna rely on another storage crop, which is garlic. We put garlic in every year and we harvest it. You will find that as the garlic ages, it does 
tend to have clothes that go a bit off. So if you can see me pressing on this clove, this is hard and firm and that clove is still good to use. And if I press on the one next to it, it gives. That means that that clove is no longer good. It's not gonna taste good. It's gonna taste old. So part of just using the produce that you store up is having some just wisdom about, do I wanna eat this? Does this look good or not? I'm just gonna add one clove of garlic. This is a pretty mellow garlic, but that's how I like my garlic. So in she goes, pinch of salt. Okay, now the other thing I'm going to add before we start, you can totally omit this, is mustard because I like it, my kids like it. So I'm just gonna add about a teaspoon of mustard. Okay, now there's only one trick to homemade mayonnaise and that's to add your oil in slowly. I'm talking like as little as possible, drip by drip at the beginning, and that's gonna help the egg yolk to sort of unify and keep the sauce from breaking, meaning separating the yolk from the oil. We want them to become homogenous and mixed together, and we do that by going slow. So you're gonna to have to just get patient, all right? Now, if anyone knows where my blender lid is, I would love to know, because I sure can't find it. So I'm gonna be substituting in my <laughs> copper lid here, I guess. I'm gonna be using olive oil. Um, this is really the only oil that I use in my kitchen. This is what I like. I buy it constantly. And um, until I can grow olives here, which is never gonna happen, I'm super grateful for good imported extra virgin olive oil. Here we go. So first it's gonna break up that garlic clove. And now we're gonna drizzle in slowly. After about five minutes and some gentle drizzling, we have this gorgeous mayonnaise. Now, mayonnaise is typically not thought of as a health food, but you guys, I'm gonna challenge that because we have really good olive oil, health food in my book, egg yolks, another health food in my book, some mustard, fresh lemon juice, fresh garlic, and salt. That's good stuff. So because I'm weird and aesthetics are really pretty to me, <laughs> I'm gonna add our gorgeous salad here, which I could have done at the beginning, into a bowl because I'm going to, just like a typical um, coleslaw, I'm just gonna add my mayonnaise into there. I don't wanna call it mayonnaise. I mean, you could call it aioli because it is a garlic mayonnaise, which is what the French call it but it's not the same thing that you may be thinking of when you think of mayonnaise. Typically coleslaws have a vinegar added, a white wine vinegar, red wine vinegar. I'm just gonna use lemon juice because lemons are in season and lemons are good. And that's just gonna give us a little bit of acid to contrast the fattiness of the oil. Yeah, good stuff going on. Don't let the lemon seeds in there. I talk about this all the time in my cooking community, but cooking is so much about creating contrast. So you have this soft, gorgeous dressing against crunchy and fresh vegetables. We've got fat from the walnuts. We've got a little bit of sweet from the apple and from the carrot. And then you've got the sharpness of the onion and it creates a little bit of a party. It can be really easy to think of winter foods as some sort of a compromise, like something we'll settle for when we can't have the best of summer. But really, I think that's just a lack of knowing how to prepare things in an exciting and good way. Because the winter, even when our produce looks a little less than perfect, has a lot to offer the kitchen. All right, here we go. If you're gonna grow your food in any capacity, you have to learn how to use up the weird bits, whether that's harvesting an animal and maybe learning how to cook a piece of meat that you're not familiar with, or 
learning how to use up produce that might look a little ugly, that might even look a little bit old, and really making it shine in the kitchen. It's part of that growth process. It's part of that joy process. There is a lot of effort represented right here in this beautiful salad, and I can't wait to enjoy it. We're gonna finish our salad with a little bit of fresh pepper, and then we are going to tuck in. If you would like to learn more about rustic farm food and learning how to find that joy in the rusticness of recipes just like this, make sure you check out the link below the video to our cooking community. There you have it, a beautiful winter slaw that celebrates all our efforts of the summer and really highlights what's best about winter. Enjoy.